Mm-hmm. Likely. All right, so I gotta I gotta tell you something, really quick. I have like kind of an obnoxiously long story. Obnoxious. Right? Is that all right? You guys gonna be all right with that? You gonna be able to stick with me? No. No? Well, I didn't. I was gonna ask you, but I'm really not. I'm gonna do it anyway, so it's <laughs> fine. Um, also, when I tell you this story, uh, just know that it involves Rachel too. But this is particularly how it pertained to me. So I'm not like excluding her from the event even though I kind of do in the story. It's just because this is how I was feeling. I'm not sure how she was feeling. I'm sure she had similar thoughts and feelings, but this is just my experience with this particular story. So it's a little bit about me. Um, when I started in the youth ministry, I was only 18 years old. Who's the oldest person in here? Anybody 17? Raise your hand if you're 17. Lots of 17s. How many 18s? One 18. Tanisha said, I'm 18. A couple 18s. All right. So when I was in, I first started being like a volunteer, the youth group uh, didn't have as many counselors in it, so they kind of picked from some of the older, older kids in the, in the youth group, and I got to help out um, in the middle school area, right? So I was considered a middle school counselor, but really I didn't have a clue what was going on. Really, um, uh, my job was just to make sure nothing was lit on fire and that people kept breathing, right? That was really my only job. I wasn't any sort of a spiritual leader or anything at that time. Um, so I didn't, I didn't really have a clue. I really just liked hanging out with my youth pastor. Youth pastor at the time was Grant Burton. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of him, but that was the youth pastor I had. And I had him for like six years. So middle school all the way through my graduation, he was my youth pastor, okay? So it was really cool. He's just a cool guy I could talk to, I could hang out with. And so... On top of that, the main service was a little, you know, a little shaky for me at 18 years old. It was kind of boring. I didn't really want to go in there. So it was, it was a lot of things coming together to say, oh, I'll just be a counselor in the youth, a counselor in the youth group, right? So, uh, like I said, though, I didn't really have any real job description. I kind of was just hanging out in the youth room for, uh, with Grant, a good friend of mine. So it's pretty easy. It's pretty fun. But then all of a sudden, Grant left. After a couple years of me doing that. Grant left the church and he was gone and all of a sudden the youth group kind of broke apart you know because the guy that had been here the staple the main youth pastor left and kids kind of just stopped coming and the excitement was gone and it's just me the volunteer you know just sitting there with like the five kids that were left in the youth group and it was kind of just in shambles and it was horrible right it wasn't really that that fun anymore um, and so um, over the course of the next few years they the church kept bringing in new youth pastors, and for whatever reason, they never really seemed to stick, right? They, it seemed like they would last around a year, maybe sometimes a little more, and then for whatever reason, they would leave. And every time one would leave, I re distinctly remember getting this thought like, oh, I wonder, wonder who the next one's going to be. I wonder, I wonder who's going to come in after that person. And there was a lot of them. Like, like I, I, I don't know. I didn't really sit there and think of how many, but like five or six of them. And it was, it was a fair amount, so it was, it was, it was pretty weird. Um, and that kind of went on until one day, um, the youth pastor at the time, is a good friend of mine, his name was Brock Powers. Anybody remember Brock Powers? Woo! Any poems, haikus, short stories? That's what he would say after all of his lessons, if anybody had any comments. Anyway, Brock Powers was a cool, bi a cool guy, but Brock moved away. He moved to Arizona. His wife got a job change and he had to leave. So uh, that was kind of a defining moment for me in my ministry life, right? Because I was a volunteer at that point. But um, it was in that moment that I kind of stopped going to youth group for the wrong reasons. I stopped going because um, it was fun or because the other service was boring or because my friends were there or because I didn't have anything else to do or because my parents made me come or because that's just something that I had done since birth, right? I was raised at Glenville. I'd always come every Wednesday and every Sunday. That's just what I did. And so in that moment, I kind of stopped. I took accountability for my ministry. Um, and it was in that moment that God kind of started to, to, to grow my passion and kind of gave me a desire to work with you guys, you awesome young individuals. I don't know what to call you guys, teenagers, young adults, hoodlums, whatever you guys want to classify yourselves as. All of a sudden, God's pressing on my heart that he's just like, I cared about the individuals that were in this room, regardless of who they were, because they change every year. I get new kids and different kids, and um, they're obviously different back from when I from when I was only, you know, in my early 20s. So I just had a heart for young adults. That's what I'll call you. It sounds so formal. I don't like it. Chumps. I had a heart for chumps, like you guys. <laughs> so now it was more than just coming here just to hang out with Grant or just to kind of be in a service that was a little more exciting or upbeat than the main service. It was now had a purpose. 
okay? I had this desire to, to teach people on what a real relationship with God actually looked like and um, kind of uh, um, how they could grow in their spiritual walk with God. And that just this desire to make it more real in people's lives because there was a, a large portion of my life where it wasn't real at all. You know, it was just kind of a game. And so maybe that's kind of what helped feed it too is that God started um, – feeding on that aspect of my life and kind of impressing me to impress it upon everybody else, right, to avoid that. And so uh, I got super excited, and I was no longer thinking like, oh, who's going to be the next guy? Instead, it was like this responsibility within myself to, regardless of um, who the youth pastor was, to start doing that, to start, um, uh, I guess, having a duty or having a job, having a responsibility within the youth group, not just sitting in the, in the audience and watching it all kind of unfold. So I was uh, super excited, but I was also terrified at the exact same time, because you probably know this, I've told you a million times, back when I was that age, I would like shake when I had to speak in front of people, and I would like lose my breath, and I would get super nervous. I still do it sometimes in the main service, like all the time, because it's a different setting. They're kind of old, and there's a lot of them, and there's like 500 people, and they're all just staring at you, and you can't really like tell them jokes or anything. And so it's just it's unnerving. Anyway, so God is essentially calling me to do something that I absolutely hate, which is how I know that it had to have been from God, because I wouldn't call myself to go do that. It was like nails on a chalkboard for me. It was like painful. I hated public speaking in all forms. And so God is now making me excited about doing something that terrifies me, if that makes sense. It was kind of cool. So um, it was also exciting because for the, for the probably the very first time in my entire life, I was excited about something that didn't selfishly involve me right? The benefit to Ben, something that's going to help me, something that's going to make me uh, more money or more friends or more anything. I was excited about doing something. Like, what are we excited about nowadays? For me, I don't know. It was like, Sunday. what? Super Bowl Sunday, right? My New England Patriots are going to win, and that excites me. That's a selfish thing for me. Or like your birthday or Christmas. It's because you get stuff, right? I don't know. So at least for me, I was a very selfish young individual where I was very rarely excited for other people. People were like, I'm having a baby. And I would be like, good. All right. See you later. <laughs> Let me know how that goes. I don't know. What do you want from me? Right. I'm not necessarily. Everybody else seems to be excited for other people. But I was, I guess, now that I think of it, kind of a selfish little punk. So uh, but this was one time where I was I was excited about other people. I was excited about the people that were going to come into this room and that they were going to have a chance to, like, change their life. Something was going to alter in their perspective or the way they live their life and the relationship they have with God. And that was exciting for me. So, um, again, I'm sure it was equally exciting for Rachel. This is just kind of my perspective. I didn't talk to her about this. I bet you she felt very, very similar about it. Um, but uh, I want to tell you a little bit about that excitement just for a second. So I had when, – when me and Rachel went to the pastor and we started to try and be the youth pastors, we just had – a zillion ideas, okay? Like lessons that we wanted to do and games that we could have and activities on site, off site, all this crazy stuff and water slides coming in through the ceiling and all this crazy stuff that we could do to not only have fun, but that would also kind of intrigue you and draw you in so that we could uh, teach you more about God. And there was all this enthusiasm and this creativity just like flying from our faces nonstop, right? And so I can just, I remember how it was. Uh, when we first started in those those first few weeks and the one thing that keeps coming to mind is just how easy it was like it wasn't difficult it was just coming all of the time all of these ideas and all these thoughts and um, what's kind of cool is for the very first year me and Rachel sat down and in one day she had a calendar because Rachel's crazy with her calendars she had a calendar for the entire year Every month with every day on it, and we filled out the entire calendar of every lesson idea, of every activity, of everything that we were going to do for that entire 365-day year in one day, okay? That's 104 lesson ideas and like 15 to 20 major activities that were like planned, organized, the ideas, everything in one solid day, Okay? It was insane. That's that's how excited we that's how excited that we were. But that's also how awesome God is. That when you're doing something that He's calling you to do, when you're doing something that you know God wants you to be a part of, you're excited about it. He generates that that powerful feeling inside of you that motivates you to do cool things, right? So this is kind of the the downward part, but not really. But look at me today, right? I don't get 104 lesson ideas in one day anymore. It doesn't happen. It hasn't happened for a long, long time. I get one, and I get it the day before I do it, okay? 
it's not the same. It is not the same feeling that I have now that I had a long time ago, two years ago. Can anybody else relate to that where you have such excitement and, and uh, this enthusiastic feeling and then as it kind of goes, you're kind of like, okay, I, I still love what I do. I'm still excited about youth group. I still love all of you guys and doing what I do, but it is just a different feeling. Anybody relate to that? A few of you? Okay. Well, it'll come because it, it happens in everything that we do in our life. Every single thing in our life, maybe not every single thing, but a lot of things that we do in our life have that, uh, that sort of flow to it. And so over time, uh, these things can start off as exciting and kind of it changes more to uh, the idea of endurance rather than excitement. You're now fueled not necessarily by your excitement, which is how we started, but now you're fueled by your endurance, your will to keep going, okay? And so that doesn't mean that being a youth pastor or all these other things in our life are uh, just a drag or that they painfully need to be endured over time. After two months of doing it, you're kind of just like this. This is horrible. I guess I'll just keep doing it because I have to. It's not like that. It's not like that at all. Um, but simply that uh, certain things in our life, like maybe like when you get married. Uh, I know I'm not married and none of you are married except for Shanda and Rachel. So they're really the only ones that can relate. But we can know. We can look at other married people and be like, oh, right, I kind of see what's going to happen. That um, you get a new job, you get a new car. All of a sudden there's that initial burst of enthusiasm and excitement. And then what happens? How long was it till you were out of your honeymoon phases? Oh, we were never out of our honeymoon phase. Tell the truth. When did it change? When did it, like, I hear these stories of like, also, I didn't even push the buttons on the microwave. I just said it in there. You're going to have to do that yourself. <laughs> I went to the store and got it. All right. So for me, the only thing, like, because I'm not married, like I said, we can look at those people and we can see that pattern. But for me, it was with this truck that I got, right? I had my old black truck. It was kind of a beat-up truck. And then over Thanksgiving, I went and I got that new truck. And it's, it's not a brand new truck, but it's new to me, right? So I was really excited when I got it because I never had a nice, a nice car before. This is my first nice car ever. And when I get it, we're in Colorado. It's uh, um, visiting my sister, and I've already bought it from my brother, but we're just hanging out with him for a few days till we go back. And I remember sitting there at night, and I would have, like, a pen, right? I'd have a pen, and I'd be like, man, I just don't know what to do with this pen. Oh, I'll go stick it out of my brand new truck. And it was just like an excuse just to go like sit in it, right? So I'd go out there and I'd open the door and I'd get in and it smelled nice and it was clean. There was no like dirt on it anywhere, right? It was clean. And uh, I'd stick the pen in the thing, well, this is where I'm going to store my pens from now on, right? And I was just like excited about dumb stuff, right? Just for no reason. I'm just sitting in it. And it's just dark and there's nothing going on. I just wanted to like be around it. And then I would get out, and I was very careful to, like, close the door so it didn't scratch anything. And then when I would park it, I, like, park super far away from everybody because then on my old truck, if people, like, open their door at the grocery store and slam into it, I'm like, who cares, right? It's a piece of crap. I don't care. You're probably going to do more damage to your car than mine. But now with my nice truck, I'll park, like, seven miles away from the grocery <laughs> store and just walk because I want to make sure that nothing is around it. Because if I get back and there's, like, a little less scratch in it, I would lose my mind. I would freak out. And I'm still kind of like that to this point, but it's wearing off. There's like stuff in my truck now, and there's like, I, sometimes I'll leave trash in there, which I never used to do. And uh, it's just kind of wearing off. It's not that I don't like my truck anymore. It's not that I'm not excited to have it anymore, but that initial burst of enthusiasm kind of has worn off. You ever get that when you get something brand new? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. So sometimes our expectations when we first are excited about that thing, whatever that thing is for you, they're unrealistic. Because we always tell ourselves, I'm going to maintain this forever. I'm going to have this truck be this nice for its entire existence. There will not be a speck of dirt. You know when you get into your car like 80 times and eventually there's like, like a sandbox at your feet, right? If you have a car, you know what I'm talking about. When you first got it, it was clean. And so every time I'd get out, I'd like wipe sand out of the bottom, the bottom of the thing to make sure that it was always nice. That lasted like a week. And then now there's sand all over it, right? Because I work in construction. So it's kind of worn off a little bit. So sometimes our expectations right from the beginning are unrealistic because of our effort to maintain them throughout. So I guess my goal in telling you that ridiculously long story and example was that sometimes in our life, in a lot of different areas, in everything that we do, we have peaks and we have valleys. We have high points in our life and we have low points in our life. And instead of trying to live excited 100% of the time with that warm, fuzzy feeling 100% of the time, we need to learn how to endure through every single situation that our life brings. Have in, do you guys know what endurance is? 
It's like when you run, if you just tried to sprint a 5K or a 10K or a marathon, you just try to run it as fast as you can right from the beginning. You're not going to make it very far, are you? Not even the best runner in the world is probably going to make it very far. I mean, he'll make it farther than us. But, like, we're not going to finish the race at full speed. We need to have endurance. We need to have the ability to have a solid pace throughout the race. All right. All right. Max likes it. Yeah. All right. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to figure out how we can do that and what the Bible says about that. If you want to turn to John chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse 1 is where we're going to be. Let me know when you get there. I'm going to wait for you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We really only need to go to John today. Chapter 15, verse 1. Thumbs up when you're there. What? I think I said 1 John again. It's just regular John. I keep saying 1 John, but it's just regular John. Okay, here we go. 1 John, not 1 John, regular John 15, verse 1. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the world which I have spoken to you. So um, let me stop just for one second and kind of give you a little bit of a backstory about what's going on. That's always super important and super helpful to me when you know who's talking, who's he talking to, what the heck is going on um, in this. Why did, he, why did Jesus say this? So I just gave it away. Jesus is talking, and who do you think he's talking to? A bunch of people. He's talking to his disciples. That's who he's talking to, okay? And now what, what's happened over, the, over the, uh, the last few years that the disciples have had with Jesus, he's done a few things. He's called them into his ministry. He's taught them, and he's performed these miracles in front of them, right? They've seen him do some really cool stuff. So they know Jesus isn't messing around, that he's the real deal, okay? Now they believe that Jesus, his purpose and his reason for being on the earth is to reign. Right is to build an earthly kingdom because right now Caesar's not being so nice to them. Caesar's the guy in Rome. You guys all know who Caesar is, okay? And he's kind of in control. And so the Jews believe that Jesus is kind of going to take him out of the picture. That he's going to raise this army. He's going to take over because that's what kings do, right? Jesus is a king, so the king's going to rule. He's going to he's going to get the old king out, and he's going to set up this this. Uh, uh, this kingdom, and of course, because they are his disciples, they will have their own indiv individual seats of power, and they will all rise and put their foot on their enemies and be like, ha ha, we won, right? And Jesus is like, oh, sweetheart. I imagine him rubbing their back and being like, mm, that's not really what's going on here. You're kind of misunderstanding. So maybe we need to sit you guys down, just sit down, get a cracker, get some milk or something, and I'm going to explain to you what's going to happen. So this is a come to Jesus moment. What? A real come to Jesus moment. So Jesus needs to straighten them out, okay? So they believe that this high they're on, that this honeymoon phase that they're on with Jesus, right, is just going to last forever. That Jesus is always going to be with them, that he's always going to take care of them and tell them what to do, and he's going to be there to teach them and solve all of their problems, and maybe put ears back on when they need to go back on. Anybody get that reference? Anybody? Okay. Huh? I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later. Okay. So, um, so Jesus, he understands the way that they're thinking. He understands their minds and their thoughts, and he needs to just set them straight, okay? So this is what he says. We're going to start over again, 15.1. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You, already, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples.
So again, these disciples have this misunderstanding of, of kind of what Jesus is there to do. And God was there to reign, but they didn't understand the idea between this physical, earthly reign and God's spiritual reign, right? God wants, God, Jesus and God are the king. They will reign. They do reign. But it wasn't exactly in the way that they thought, okay? So Jesus is kind of turning it into this, uh, this example with the vine and the vine dresser and the branches because they don't get it. This is what Jesus did a lot of times. When people didn't understand what he was saying, he would kind of simplify it down into terms that they would get because they understood vines and vineyards and how those relationships worked. And when Jesus says, okay, this is you, I imagine him almost with stick figures up. Be like, this is what you're doing. This is me, and this is how we're going to interact. Right? He's very, he's very much so simplifying it for them so they can kind of understand what's about to happen. And so um, he had to tell the disciples, he says, what is the main thing that he's saying in the verse? He says, abide in me, live in me, and I'm going to live in you. So in the, sorry, what? Absolutely. Jesus says, if you live in me, I'm going to live in you. If you abide in me, I'm going to abide in you. And we're going to kind of go kind of peel that verse apart. So we'll get back to that part. But uh, so beginning in chapter 15, Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. And God is the vine dresser, right? The, the guy that walks around the vineyard and like prunes all the trees, okay? So not only is Jesus the vine, but it says that he's the true vine. What does that mean to you? If he's the true vine, what does that mean about other vines? Not only are they not the true vine, but that there are other vines. There are other vines to choose from in life that we can attach ourselves to. And this is here saying that Jesus is the true vine and that we need to make sure that we're on the right vine because we're the branch, Right? As the people, we're the branch, and we need to make sure that we are attached to the true vine. Also, as the true vine, Jesus, it says uh, there in John chapter 15, that Jesus is the sole source of all life, strength, and fruit. All of it. Everything that is produced from that vine is because he is doing it, because of his power. Okay? Um, and that's in verse 4. It says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides. In the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Go home, find a tree, chop a branch off, stick it in the ground, and see if it grows anything. It won't. Branches all laying all over my yard, they're all dead. Okay? Because that's what happens when you cut them off from the vine. When you cut them off from the source of life, from the source of fruit, from the source of power, which is Jesus Christ, we will die. Okay? We cannot do anything unless we are attached to the true vine. As the branches, who's that? Who's the branches? Us. Cheating, kind of telling you. So as the branches, our main objective is simply to bear fruit. Does anybody know what it means to bear fruit? Somebody tell me. Huh? What does it mean to bear fruit, Joey? How do we do that? What does it look like? Give me an example. Try it, Clayton. Absolutely. Can 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 somebody give me an over general like if you had to sum up all of it in like three or four words, what would you call exactly what Clayton just said? Giving them a taste. Serving Jesus, giving them a taste of God. Sharing your faith. Planting seeds. Living living the Bible. Being Christ-like, exactly. Anything that brings glory to God is going to produce fruit, and that's our job as the branch. That's it. And that's kind of a lot of it's, because anything that brings glory to God could be a lot of different things, like all you guys just said. But that's our job as Christians, as the branches, is to bear the fruit. Okay? So, um, have you guys ever heard of the church called the Body of Christ? Yeah. A few of you have heard that before? Okay. So, as the Body of Christ... People should look at us, and they should see Christ. Why? Because we're supposed to be his hands, we're supposed to be his feet, and we're supposed to be his mouth. That means anywhere we go, anything we do, anything we, should, anything we say should always point people back to Christ. Everything that we say. And that's hard. That's a lot of responsibility. Every word that comes out of my mouth in this podium or in, you know, anywhere else in the world is always supposed to point other people to Christ. That's a difficult task. That's a, that's a lot of responsibility if you really think of it, that every word, every action, every place you go in this life should always in some way be pushing other people to Jesus Christ. That's our job as the branches. And that's in verse 5. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Now, as the vine dresser, that's God. God is involved in the relationship between the vine 
and the branches, between you and Jesus, between me and Jesus, God is kind of the go-between. He's in between. It's his job to kind of take care of that relationship, all right? And so he deals with both the fruitful branches and the unfruitful, unfruitful branches. With the unfruitful branches, the Bible says that they will wither and they will be burned. That's in verse 6. It says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. So, but with the fruitful branches, the Bible says in verse 2 that they will be pruned so that they will what? Why do they prune the, prune the, the branches? Hmm? To bear more fruit, exactly. So even when we're on the vine, even when we're doing what we're supposed to do, we're following God's word, we're going to church, we're doing all these things that, that we believe God is calling us to do, that we're supposed to be doing, God's still pruning you. I don't know if you, like, pruning is like cutting. It, it, if I was a tree and I could feel things, I don't imagine that would always feel very good. So sometimes as Christians, God's still molding us. He's still shaping us for the sole purpose of us being able to bear even more fruit. Because that's his goal. That's his purpose is to get more glory for himself. And that's our job is to give it to him. Right? So I love that because there's never a point in your Christianity and your walk with God where you can be like, I'm a super Christian. <laughs> Done. Check. Next. There's always something more. God's always lobbing something off and he's pruning you. He's getting rid of all the stuff, even as small as it might be. Some of us, we have more pruning needed than others, right? But God's pruning us to get rid of all of the unnecessary things on our branch so that we have more room to bear fruit. Always. It never stops. It never ends. It takes endurance to get through that race like Paul talks about. Okay, so um, let me see where I left off. Okay, so God says, abide in me and I will abide in you, live in me and I will live in you like Clayton was talking about. Now, let me tell you something. Sometimes, sometimes we're funny as Christians. We're funny a lot, actually. In a lot of my lessons, I'm usually laughing at us, me included, um, of how, how we act with God. And it's just a funny relationship sometimes. Sometimes we actually try and exist away from the vine. We actually try and live outside of Jesus Christ. We still go to church. We kind of hear some, some scriptures. We listen to Ben and Rachel preach, and we, we say some prayers, and then we go home, and we don't live on the vine. We're not attached to it in any single way, and, uh, but for some reason, we still expect to be a part of the vine, right? Because we did those Christian-y type things, we, we get this feeling like, oh yeah, I'm part of the vine. But then all of a sudden, we wonder why we're being cut down, why we're withering, why our life is withering, why we're not bearing any fruit in our life, and uh, all of a sudden we're in this, this stunt mode, like we don't get it, like, oh God, I wonder why all this stuff is happening, right? And it's not like, not like we're being punished, but we wonder why no fruit is being produced in our life, it's because we're not attached to the vine. And that's funny, that's funny to me, because uh, frequently in the Bible we read about other people doing stupid stuff, and we're like, man, you guys are stupid, right? Like the Israelites... The Israelites wandering around and bread's falling from the sky and seas are being parted and they're still like whining and complaining. And you're like, bread's falling from the sky and oceans are being parted. Don't you get it, right? And it just seems so obvious to us and so simple to us. But how stupid are we sometimes when we do those exact same things where we see God move and we see God work in our life and we go to camp and we get on these super highs and we get super excited and we get super enthusiastic and then like, what, a week later, we're kind of back into like the, the meh kind of just whatever life we were before, and we just forget all of it. We don't remember. We have very, we're like goldfish. <laughs> I would tell you this, but I think Justin's going to edit it out. That's okay. Justin, you can edit this out if you want to. Okay, so uh, goldfish, you can feed them. They can go to the bathroom, turn around, forget that they just ate, and think it's their food, and then eat it. Short-term memory. Gold, the, if anybody tells you you have a memory of a goldfish, it's like two or three seconds. And then they're like, ooh, something new, right? Even though it's not. Okay? So we forget the awesome things that God has done in our life. We forget, we forget all of the things that he's doing around us and working in us. And, and we, get dis, we get discouraged, right? Because all of a sudden it's not so exciting. It's not so enthusiastic. And we fail to endure throughout all of those things. Let me find my spot. Hold on one sec. Okay. And so this is what Jesus is saying to his disciples. He doesn't pretend that the world's always going to be that high, that they're always going to have this warm, fuzzy feeling. Um, we were over in like verse 1 to 10 range, but if you jump over to verse 18, it says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hate you. And yeah, we brought that up in our 9 a.m. service. So that, that's pretty cool. Um, 
but he's not sugarcoating it, right? He's, not, he's saying that, hey, I'm not always going to be here, but if you abide in me, I'm going to abide in you. If you live in me, I'm going to live in you. And so when I'm gone, don't expect everything to just be awesome all the time. It's not going to be. You're going to have highs and you're going to have lows. People will even hate your guts, but just know that they don't hate you because of you. They hate you because of me, because of what I did. So, the, um, so he instructs them to abide in him. In any situation in our life, we have to remember to abide in Jesus Christ. Whether it's a high point, whether it's a low point, if we abide in Jesus Christ, um, it, it goes on in verse 7, it says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. And you know why that is? It's, it's because, um, um, oh, one interesting thing that I found about that, it says, it doesn't say, if you ask, it says, if you abide in me, my words will abide in you. And when you ask, when you ask of anything, your desires will be given to you. Why is that? It's because all of a sudden when we're abiding in Christ, he's abiding in us. And now all of a sudden his words are also abiding in us. His words, the things we ask for, will then always be to glorify God if we're abiding in him. If we're attached to the vine, if we're producing fruit, all of a sudden we're abiding in God and God's words are abiding in us. Everything that comes out of our mouth at that point is going to lead to glorification to God, which is why we will then have everything that we want. He will grant us whatever we say because we are abiding in him. That's why that's the precursor. That's why that's the requirement to him giving us whatever we want. A lot of times people read verses like that and be like, oh, all they have to do is this and now I just get whatever I want. I'm going to get myself a Ferrari. Ferrari, please, right? It's not, it doesn't work like that. We need to be abiding in Christ so that everywhere we go, everything we think, everything we do, everything we say is constantly bringing glory to God. And when we can get to that point, then God's going to give us the desires of our heart. He says in verse 8, just to wrap it up, by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So he gives you the desires of your heart when you're at that point because it glorifies God. Because he's getting something from it. Because when we do those things, he knows that it's not for some selfish reason. It's not because Ben gets a new Xbox or whatever. It's because something is being done to glorify God. And therefore, he will give us the desires of our hearts. So regardless of what peak you're in, what valley you're in, if you're excited, if you're enthusiastic, we need to remember to abide in the vine. To endure life, regardless of whatever situation comes our way, regardless if something is good, then we need to make sure that we're constantly giving glory to God and we're constantly looking to stay attached to not only the vine, but the true vine, to Jesus Christ. And that we can allow him to um, prune our branches and to mold us and to shape us to do whatever it is that brings glory to him. And so uh, that's, that's just the message I wanted to bring to you today. And uh, just to kind of give you a different perspective on, you can apply that to so many different things in your life, to everything that there is. It's not always going to be awesome. It's not always going to be easy. People aren't always going to like you. People aren't always going to be saying how awesome you are and cool you are and how much they like you. Sometimes it's going to be tough. People might even hate you at times. But if we abide in Christ, the Bible says, which this is becoming one of my favorite passages, if we abide in him, he's going to abide in us. And how cool is that? That the creator of the entire universe says that he's going to live in us if only we choose to live in him. And he's going to give us his words, he's going to give us his power, and he's going to give us the desires of our hearts so we can go out and glorify him with everything that we do, everything that we say, and everywhere that we go. All right. Um, if you guys want to bow your heads uh, and close your eyes, I will pray for us and we will be done. Father God, Lord, we just come before you uh, this morning, God, and we just thank you so much. Uh, God, for this promise that you gave us that, that if we abide in you, God, that you will also abide in us. I just pray that um, you can call us to action, God, and that you can make us aware, God, that all we need to do is to abide in you. That if we have a relationship, God, with you and we just seek to abide in you in everything that we do, God, and that you will uh, work through us and that you will uh, be glorified through all of our actions and everything um, that we say and do, God, in our life. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.